Can the brothers and sisters please take a seat as we will be beginning the program now. A'udhu billahi min ash rajim bismillahir rahman rahim In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad and his blessed progeny. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sheikh Abbas Jafar, distinguished guests, respected elders of the community, brothers and sisters, peace be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We offer our condolences to the present Imam of our time, Imam al Hujja, Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajal Allah Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif, and to the Muslim Ummah on the martyrdom of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. And once again, welcome you to Al Iman's Muharram program for 2018. Before we begin the program, we would like to remind you of some important rules to ensure you gain the most from tonight. Please switch off your mobile phone or put it on silent. We ask everyone to stay inside the hall during the lecture and to not loiter outside. Please respect one another during the program and allow your fellow brother and sisters to listen to the program in peace. And a reminder that we are streaming the lectures live every night on the Al Iman YouTube channel for those who cannot attend, if you'd like to let them know. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. To bless the night, we will be hearing a short recitation from the Holy Quran. Of the many blessings in the Holy Quran are its reminder of the signs that surround us every day, which teach and inspire us. Most importantly, the Quran reminds us of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These blessings are things that we probably forget on a day-to-day -day basis, which is most likely why in Surah Ar-Rahman we are reminded over and over again, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, so which of the favors of your Lord will you then deny? With this in mind, please welcome Brother Jawad Tanana to the stage with three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تتغوا في الميزان وأقيموا الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسروا الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريحان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان خلق الإنسان من صلصال كالفخار وخلق الجان من مارج من نار 
ربكما تكذبان متكئين على فرش بطائنها بطائنها من استبرق وجن الجنتين دان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان فيهن قاسرات الطرف لم يطمثهن إنس قبلهم ولا جان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان كأنهن الياقوت والمرجان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان هل جزاء الإحسان إلا الإحسان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان ومن دونهما جنتان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان مدهامتان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان صدق الله العلي العظيم أفلح من صلى على محمد وآل محمد Thank you, brother, for that beautiful recitation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. A reminder that our Thursday night program will not be held here in Hurstville. It will be at the Orion Center in Campsie, starting at 7.30. If you would please pass on the message to your friends and family that it is not here on Thursday night, it will be in Campsie. Another reminder as well that after tonight's lecture, there will be a majlis by Brother Hussein Jamali, followed by a latmiya by Brother Hamid Atai. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As we sit here every night, we need to ask ourselves, why do we choose to listen to religious lectures and what is their importance? Of course, we know that majalis have a spiritual role in our lives, but in order for us to awaken our hearts and souls, we need to ensure we awaken the mind first. To do this, we must educate ourselves. Certainly, religious lectures are one form of education in the area of religion, but we should not limit knowledge to only one-dimensional interactions nor should we limit our education only to traditional school systems. Education is an active occupation that involves the student seeking knowledge guided by their own intrinsic motivation. It is narrated that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, the learned are the heirs of the prophets for the prophets did not leave behind a legacy of wealth but that of knowledge. So whoever partakes of it derives a plenteous benefit. We now live in an information-rich era where information is available to us at the touch of a finger or the flick of a page. But unfortunately, we have turned this information into social avenues and cut off vital resources that we should all be participating in. So let us channel the passion we have for religious lectures into passion to learn about everything, no matter the subject. Engage in reading, discussion, writing, and learning as much as you can. The Holy Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Kul Rabbi zidni alman. Say, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. An educated community is a stronger, better represented, and thriving community. Inshallah, we can grow together as we become more educated and use this knowledge to better spread the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Tonight, we again seek knowledge from Sheikh Abbas Shafar. 
To welcome him to the stage, please recite three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Just before the Sheikh begins to speak, a lot of you may have noticed that there is a flag on the stage that says Ya Hussein. Uh, this flag has come to us from Karbala. We are very lucky to have it here tonight. Um, we would like to invite people onto the stage to touch it or to um, see it. At the very end of the program, after the Latmiya, you are welcome to come on stage to re um, receive its blessings, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى عطرته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Yesterday we spoke about the idea of the nafs and soul, intellect Qalb, these are words used in the Quran interchangeably for an existence that is sublime, that is something that we're not always aware of, and yet is the most important part of our existence, the real part of our existence. Oftentimes, though, it is overshadowed by the very loud demands of the material self, and our job in dunya is not to get blinded by that. It would be a shame for us to live no more than a, more than a sophisticated animal, really, to eat when we are hungry, to rest when we are tired, to take mates, to have children. And that becomes a sum total of our entire activity in dunya. We were created for something better. We are better than that. So the search is on then to connect with the soul, to realize we have a soul and to work on the soul and that has been the theme of the talks this time. Within that we looked at the idea that the nafs has a lower part and a higher part. The higher nafs is the one that is viewing divinity and the lower part is the one that is facing dunya and it is our job to keep those two in perspective. Dunya is something we will leave behind. No matter what kind of thing we acquired in dunya, it will all be left behind. Now we will take what we appreciated with the higher soul to the next part. So that was the sum of what we talked about yesterday and we said about the duties we have to our nafs and our soul and I gave you some examples of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that if you ignore this, nafs, the higher nafs, in time you disconnect from me. And when you disconnect from me, you are lost. You are lost. And in hadith we have, man nasiya subhanahu ansahu allahu nafsa. Whoever chooses not to be connected to God, Allah causes him to forget his existence. It means you forget why you have come. And years and years pass, and towards the evening part of your life, at the end of your life, when you look back, you realize you are taking very little from that life that Allah gave to the next part of your journey. So may Allah protect us from this, inshallah wa ta'ala. Part of this spiritual health, spiritual training um, is, according to the hadith of the Imam, having a per proper connection to God, a proper relationship with yourself, a proper relationship with others and that's what I want to talk about today and then inshallah tomorrow uh, or perhaps the day after the proper relationship with dunya 
So to give us this spiritual fitness, Imam alayhi salam, as I said in this beautiful hadith, uh, which is worth pondering about, for each of these four particular aspects, he gives seven examples of what to do. So that we know the blueprint which we can follow. As far as having the correct relationship with others, Imam Ali Salam says, Wa usulul muamilatil khal qasaba. The relationship with others is founded or is based or is guided by seven things. Al Helm. Helm is the first one, which is tolerance of others, forbearance. Wal afu, forgiveness. What tawadu, humbleness. Was sakha, generosity. Was shafaka, love. Wan nasah, which means well wishing. Wal adl, justice. Wal insaf, fairness. I will deal with the first three, and inshallah, as you look at the hadith, if you get, another, if you get a chance, you can look at the rest. Um, as well. Hilm. What is Hilm? Hilm is when we, when people behave badly and people always will behave in according to their understanding of what they think is right to do when it affects us badly. We should be tolerant of it. When people say things that are against our belief, when people do things that we dislike, there are two ways to react. One is to get all excited about it, to start saying, what are you doing? You have no right to think like this. You have no right to believe this. And one is to be tolerant. Especially, Hilm comes into play when you have the ability to actually act and to close them down. Now, of course, we're not referring to somebody who is harming society or someone who is coming to you, you know, with an obvious intent to cause you serious harm and you say, well, fair enough, here I am, you know, I will tolerate this. No. But oftentimes, there are people who look at things differently or there are people who do things to us. Helm becomes operative when we have the ability to actually take revenge, do something to them, yet we hold our hand back. This is hell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is halim. Alhamdulillahi alladhi, alhamdulillahi ala hilmihi ba'da ilmi. All praise belongs to God who is forbearant despite his knowledge. What knowledge? He knows that we do things defiantly. He knows that we do things knowing that we're doing the wrong thing. We stand in front of God and said, I know what you want, I want something else, sorry. He has this ilm and he has the ability to immediately, man is so vulnerable and yet so defiant. Allah says in the Quran, we created you in Surah Yasin from a small drop and look how you strut with so much arrogance, right? We are what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is halim. Let's it go. We are taught to do this, that when somebody does something and you can do something about it, be forbearant, be tolerant, be calm. Many examples in history that we have heard about, I bring you a couple to remind us. In a very interesting episode in Kufa, what happened at the time of Amir al-Mu'minin was there was a man walking in, ta in the streets of Kufa and he was bald and he looked like an ordinary man and there was another person, a fool, you know, trying to make people laugh and he was eating dates and taking the date stones and throwing it at people. He saw this person and he threw it at him at his back. The man didn't do anything, he walked away. Someone said to this person, do you know who you threw it at? He said, no. He said, that is the general of Ali bin Abi Talib. His name is Malik al -Ashtar. Now, <laughs> this person began to quake. He's thinking, who have I hit? This is not an ordinary man. What is he going to do? So he began to go after him and he saw Malik enter the mosque. He entered the mosque, he saw him praying. He's standing there nervous. The moment Malik finished, he came to him to apologize. He said, you know what, I should not have hit you. 
I am really sorry. Malik said to him, I've been praying for your guidance. This is, I came to the mosque after he hit him for two rakat salat. Ya Allah, may Allah guide him. This is hell. If Malik wanted to make a big fuss of it, it could have made things very tough for him, right? But he did not. And this is something that Amirul Mu'minin alayhi salam has got some hadith in, in Nahj Balagha, which really is our book. It's the book of our Imam. We should try to read it as much, you know, even if we break it down into, say, you know, one page a day, we should read it because there is beauty in the way he talks. You could share it with your friends and they would look at it and they would say, whoever this person is, this is wisdom. He's got universal wisdom. In one of the hadiths, he says something marvelous. He says, do not do two things. Because if you do those two things, invariably you will regret it. And he said, do not promise anything when you are happy. And do not threaten anyone when you are angry. In both cases, you will regret it. You know, sometimes we come home and we make all sorts of promises to our family because we're happy, it's all good, right? And then, of course, a month later, we are asked to be true to those promises. That's when we think, I must have been mad to say I would do this because this is hard. And then we break those promises or we resent those promises. Or alternatively, in a fit of anger, we say things to people and later on we wish we hadn't because we didn't mean it in the way it came out. And people remember words longer than they remember blows, isn't it? So Amir al is saying, be forbearant. The first instinct to act, just stop and think whether you want to really do this. And this is not easy. Actually, it's not easy at all. There's a beautiful uh, had, uh, hadith, no, it's a story that, that happened in the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. So he was in Medina and he saw some young men. And what they were doing was they were lifting heavy stones to, sh you know, to train or to just build up their strength, you know. And the Prophet Sallallahu passed by and he said that you guys are very strong. But shall I tell you who is stronger? They said, yeah, we want to know who is stronger. He said, stronger is the one who doesn't retaliate when somebody offends, does, uh, behaves in an offensive or hurtful manner to him. He does not retaliate. Rather, he tolerates, just lets it go. That is strength. Sometimes the youngsters will come up to me and say, you know, uh, Abbas uncle, how many pounds can you push, you know, in the gym? How strong are you? I don't know how many pounds I can push in the gym. I don't go very often. But these kids are all, it's a number. So I say to them, I don't know, but I'll tell you something. I can push my quilt off in the morning and pray Fajr. Are you as strong as that? That's my strength. If you can do that, and you can lift your quilt and put it aside and go pray Fajr, you are strong. This, this helm takes courage. Sometimes we misunderstand where strength lies. And we look at a person and we think this is a weak person. But the one who has that ability to clamp down, think, let that anger subside. Abir al would say, the sweetest thing I have ever swallowed is my own anger. MashaAllah. The sweetest thing I have ever swallowed. It's not easy, and you need guts, you need courage, and you need strength to do that. Another tradition, these traditions or these stories that we have in our Islamic history, they are worth visiting and revisiting often because in them there is great learning. Once a man came in Medina to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. He was a Bedouin from the desert. And you know, these guys from the desert, they tend to be a little bit, you know, they don't have that veneer of, of, of politeness. They say things as they are, they're a bit gruff. So he came and he said to the Prophet, give me something, I'm, you know, I need, I have some needs, give me what you can now. Rasulullah gave him actually. What he had in front of him, he gave him. Now, 
This man was disappointed. It wasn't much. Prophet had a few things. Madina was not very wealthy. He had a few things. He said, okay, you can take this. So he got angry and he said some very nasty things, some very rude things. So much so that the Sahaba stood up in anger and they wanted to beat him up. The Prophet stopped them, said, leave him alone, leave him alone. And then he took him, he said, come with me to my home. So he took him to his own house. And there was a few things there. He said, these are a couple more things I give you from my house. Now when the man saw how the house was, it was very simple. Just a one room with a curtain, his wife was behind the curtain, prophet was in that room, he would meet the people in that simple thing, there were very few furnishings around, he became very embarrassed and ashamed actually. Because in his mind, he had come to see the prophet, he expected that it would be like a king and there would be a lot of wealth and he was initially disappointed with what he was given. Now when he saw the reality, he was embarrassed, so he asked for forgiveness. He said, I'm so sorry. The prophet said, I forgive you, stay here. He said some nice things. The prophet said, I'm happy with what you say. Why don't you sleep here today in my house, and then tomorrow you can go back. So he slept. The next day when he woke up, Rasulullah told him, look, you spoke badly yesterday. And then you said some things and I forgave you and everything's okay. But my Sahaba did not hear that. They only heard what you spoke and they're angry. I don't want for you to go away and somebody chases you or you come back to Medina and they see you and there's a problem. Why don't you say what you said here in front of them? So he went to the mosque, he said to the people, I was out of line, what I said was wrong, Prophet has forgiven me, and then he went away. Now comes the interesting bit. The Prophet told them that, you know what happened yesterday and your reaction, your initial reaction is the same as if a man has got a camel who's a little bit obstinate, shying away from him, trying to run away and everybody else starts to chase the, chase the camel to try to control it and the camel gets worse and worse. Instead of that, that owner tells everybody, please move away. And then he goes with a little bit of grass to the camel and he quietens it down and he takes it. He says, this is the difference. That sometimes all that is required is a little bit of patience and forbearance and tolerance. And you can win people rather than use your superior numbers at that point, your superior strength to cut that person down out of anger because you can. This is helm. The second and very, very important stage I want to spend some time on today is Afu, forgiveness. We should learn to forgive, all right? This is, it's hard, especially when the other person is, you know, has hurt us. We feel that if we forgive them, then, you know, they'll get more bold next time. They do more things because they think you're a pushover. Or we feel we want justice for what they've done to us they've hurt us, they've done wrong to us over the years, or in this particular instance, or we want revenge, or we feel they must apologize first. It's their fault. All these things and a variety of these things cause problems between friends, colleagues, family members. This is, you know, the people we get, we, we know, this can happen. And it's hard. It's hard to to, to forgive sometimes, but we are told for your soul's sake, learn to forgive. It's all about growth of the soul. And when you have this anger inside you about someone, righteous anger, I'm not saying you're angry with someone for the wrong reasons, no. You, you are right to be hurt. What they've done is wrong. What they've done is not just. Now you're holding on to it. Islam teaches and psychology teaches as well that ultimately it is you who become imbalanced because of this anger that you hold, right? Um, there's a very interesting story in Zen, Zen Buddhism. They, I love these stories that they teach when you first enter into these uh, schools or these ashrams. They have little stories that they tell so that you can learn a few things. They tell the story of a Zen master 
somebody who was a practitioner and an expert, he was walking with a student who had just been in the monastery for a short time. And he was very, very uh, happy to be with this great master they were walking. And he thought he would learn a lot from him and he was eager to do so. They were walking quietly. What they saw was they saw a young lady and she was stuck in the mud. And she obviously could not get out. She was stuck and she was asking for help. Now, according to their faith, they cannot touch a Namahara woman. So the young acolyte, he's looking, unsure what to do. The master, to his amazement, walks in, picks up the woman, and brings her to dry land and leaves her there, and then they continue to walk. Now, this young man, he doesn't know what to say. He's, he's thinking, how did Molana do this? This is impossible, right? The Molana in, you know, the Zen Molana. And, but he didn't dare to ask because he didn't have the courage. And the old man is not saying anything either. They walked along for a couple of hours. Finally, he couldn't stop himself. He said, you know, that lady, we... And what, she, what he said to him was that, look, I held her for a moment and I released her. You have held her for two hours. Two hours you have held this woman. And this is exactly how it is. The anger we hold, brothers and sisters, burns us up in the end. We, it leaks out into everything we do. I am angry with my father. I am angry with a friend, whatever. It now leaks out in the way I talk to my kids. It took, leaks out in the way I deal with other. The impatience comes across in relations and relationships which they didn't deserve me to be like that with them. But the anger is somewhere else. It's because I am not ready to let that go. We should forgive. It's not easy. We should forgive. How do we forgive? First of all, we realize, A, number one, this is something that allows my soul to grow. There is a lightness when you choose to truly forgive. You will find you actually come to tears yourself. When you sit down and say, whether you say to that person or you don't say to the person themselves, but you say to yourself, I truly have forgiven them, you yourself will cry because of the weight that has suddenly come off your shoulders. You have decided to forgive and you have in that way removed a great burden from yourself because now you can move on to something, number one. Number two, how do you forgive this person when you look at them as more than their sin, more than what they've done to you? They are a human being. They're not, very few human beings are pure evil. They're not do, they did not do this malevolently because they are shaitan. What they did is they're confused. They did this to you in an attempt thinking that that would make them happy, maybe, but they were wrong. And they acted wrongly. They are going through their own journey and their own struggle and their own problem. They have to sort that out with God. However, you look at them and more than that, you try to see if there was something good that came from them. You try to see if there was a reason they behaved this way. People generally, generally do not behave badly unless there is a cause somewhere else. Try to see that. They may have done something by mistake. They may have done something because really you happen to be there but the problem was elsewhere. There are a hundred reasons why they could have done something. People say, how many times should I forgive this person? You know, actually, Isa alayhi salam was asked this question. Nabiullah Isa, Jesus. How many times should we forgive those people who wrong us? And Isa alayhi salam answered, of course, he was Rasulullah. He said, as many times as you want God to forgive you. Do you want God to forgive? Yes, of course. We keep going to God and saying, we keep messing up. Ya Allah, forgive me. You want that forgiveness till the last breath. You forgive people till your last breath. And then you can stand in front of God and say, look, I never had any rancor in my heart. Although I was wronged, I always forgave. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, forgive me. This is something that I can come with and show you. I forgave people who hurt me. I forgave people who 
injured me. Question sometimes that is asked, what if I ask forgiveness from someone, myself, and they say, I will never forgive you till you die, till I die. This has happened. Somebody rang me once and he said to me, I went and sought forgiveness from someone because I did do wrong. And they told me, for what you've done, I will hold you on the day of judgment. And he says, that's killing me. It's killing everything I do. I'm thinking, you know what, whatever I do, this person's going to be waiting for me on the day of judgment. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't work like this. In clear hadith we have that each to his duty. I wrong you, my duty is to ask for your forgiveness sincerely. And to put right if I have harmed your interests in any way. If I have stolen from you, I should return that. It's not that I say, okay, you gave me a loan five years ago, now forgive me for not paying you and also forgive the loan. No. But I do everything to put things right. And you tell me, I don't forgive you. Hadith tells us that you can actually ignore that remark completely. It does not matter what they say at that point because your duty is to do the right thing. Put it right, ask for their forgiveness, and make sure sincerely you are repentant. After that, it's their journey. Because what they are now doing is they're holding on to something. At the same time, they're going to ask God to forgive them while they're not ready to forgive. That's their journey. And you can ignore that part so long as you've done your part. Forgiveness and loving and hating, the one of the aspects we are told in hadith that is very useful, if we can inculcate it, is that don't love except for God's sake. Don't hate except for God's sake. And love everyone and hate everyone, or hate anyone you want, uh, because initially you love Allah. And as an extension of your love for Him, you love this other person or thing. So you look at your parents. Parents, it's not so important who occupies that role in your life. Who is mother? Who is father? They're individuals. You love them as individuals, but what really is important is the status, is the position that they occupy. That is sacred to God. It just so happens that not a very good person is occupying it in your life, maybe. But that doesn't matter. What is sacred is motherhood and fatherhood. This to Allah is sacred. And He wants you to respect this individual because they are your mother, not because of who they are as an individual. And so there is nothing they can do which would reduce them in your eyes because your love for them, your regard for them is behind your love for Allah. Your connection is with God and God instructs you to love your children. God instructs you to love your husband or your wife. God instructs you to love your Parents, God instructs you to love your fellow mu'min, right? And that is why you love them. And that is how he wants us to live. He wants us to live in community, society. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam wants us to come to him in community and society. He, there's no point going to al Hussein alayhi salam and say to him, I love you, ya Aba Abdullah, but I don't get on with my father, with my mother, with my brother, with my mu'min brother. I don't get on, but you know, I love you. No, it's very interesting. Imam al-Sadiq teaches when you, when you approach al Hussein, he doesn't want to hear inni silmun lak. He says, inni silmun liman salamakum. I want to let you know and assure you, ya Aba Abdullah, I am at peace, not with you. I am at peace with the ones who are at peace with you. That means those who love you, I love them because of my extension, an extension of my love for you. Do you see? This is much easier because when you love someone, you make yourself vulnerable to hurt. But if you only love God, I mean, don't go home and tell your wife, I love you because I love God. It doesn't work like that normally, or your husband for that matter. Um, 
But the truth is that the love for Allah is not an unrequited love. It is not a love which will disappoint. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to that love. And because you love him, you love everything to do with him. You love everything that he commands to love. And so everything is, there is a buffer between you and individuals that allows you, the buffer is Allah, that allows you to protect your own psyche. Because with the love of God, you can never be disappointed. And on the day of judgment, these things will matter. There's a very beautiful hadith that says, on the day of judgment, as you know, it is different for different people as to how quickly they will be processed. This is one of the great problems on the day. It is a 50,000 year long day uh, before the final, you know, whether, wherever you're going. But not everybody has to wait for 50,000. For some, as Rasulullah would say, the moment they are raised, they are immediately told, go, go to Jannah. For others, it's a long haul. And, you know, some stages will take a long time, 50 stages of 1,000 years. Um, some of them will be tough. Some of them will be relatively easier for people. But it's very interesting that there is several groups of people who are singled out in hadith who will be fast-tracked. Amongst them, this hadith. That on the day of judgment, Rasulullah said, an, a, a, a caller will call out, what? O oh, Ahlul Fadl, rise up. O oh, people of merit, stand up. Now that doesn't mean the, you, know, you think that's me, I stand up. No, because on that day there's no lies. On that day there's no pretense. On that day you can't do anything that is not true. Because your inner part is now external, your soul is blazing out, there is no lies. So a group of people will stand. They will be asked, so what is your merit? What is your fadl? And they will answer, we joined with our family when they cut off from us. They said, we don't want nothing to do with you. But we kept banging the door. We kept turning up on certain occasions, even though we didn't get good respect, even though they looked down at us. But we never said, you know what? Lakum dinukum waliyadin. No, they're our father. They're our mother. They're our brother. They're our sister. They won't want to do anything with us. But we're there all the time on those occasions. And family, we're there and we, we reach out, they don't reach out, okay, fine, no problem. We don't say anything nasty, but we joined with those who cut off with us. And we gave to those who had deprived us. So when we needed, they did not give us. When we were in need, they didn't want anything to do with us. Now we have the upper hand, and they are our responsibility, we gave them. We did not say, you know what, it's now time for your turn. No, we gave. This is not easy. This is very hard. That is why on that day, this group is singled out. And we forgave those who wronged us. We forgave them. Truly forgave them. And the angels tell them, yes, these are truly merits. So do not tarry anymore. Do not wait anymore. Rather proceed to Jannah. The day is over for you. This day is over, khalas. You don't have to wait now, be processed. So, this is something that we need to think about, we need to work on. It's not easy, I know, and everybody's in his own situation. But these are the Islamic guidelines. This is what we have been guided to do. Please recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And the third, and then I, inshallah we'll see if we get chance tomorrow, because I want to uh, try to tie it all down as well. Um, but the third one I will talk about is tawadu, humbleness. This is very important. In life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people merits over other people. He makes people above other people. There's a whole hierarchy of, in society. And when you are higher and you feel that trace of arrogance because you have more power more influence, more money, more knowledge, whatever more you have compared to a person, you feel you are more faith. You look down at them. The moment you look down at them, you actually harm yourself. Your soul contracts because of that arrogance. And so we have to be very careful that humbleness 
is something you know that we need to inculcate it's a, a sign of maturity a mature person will never be arrogant you know in there's a beautiful hadith called hadith of miraj um, and uh, in that it is when the prophet came back from miraj people asked him what happened part of what happened he narrated and it's, it's a large hadith i believe it may be translated into english um, in that there is a beautiful interview of God and of the Prophet by God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him a series of questions and the Prophet out of his humbleness says the same answer to all the questions I don't know a man with his knowledge he said, yeah, Allah, I don't know you tell me and he told him do you know Oh Ahmed he addressed him as Ahmed throughout the interview do you know O oh, Ahmed why I love you so much and why I gave you fadila over everyone he says I don't know he says because of your humbleness you are the most humble in my creation and that person who doesn't have any trace of himself in his heart of course the place is taken by God but when we want God and us then there is always a tension because of your humbleness. And in his classic style, Amirul Mu'mineen, saying to people, become humble. It's the one gift nobody will envy you for. You know, people have gifts, everybody envies them. He said, nobody will envy a humble person. What's there to envy? He's humble. Oh. Humility, especially when you have something, when you are able to display some fadila, some, some merit, the humility. It's very interesting and I, I like to bring anecdotes here because I think that for me personally they embed these stories in there and there are beautiful examples we have. In Kufa, the time is now where Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is the Khalifa and what happens is he's walking in the street, he sees a girl crying, she's a slave girl, he, she's weeping. So he says, are you okay, what's the matter? She said, I went to buy dates from the market and I brought them in and my master says to them that they are not good. They're not the right, you know, they're not proper dates. They're not good dates. Go return them. So I went to return them and the owner, he said to me, you have bought them now. That's it. I'm not taking this back. And now if I go in, my master is a man of quick anger. He will punish me. So she's sitting there outside the house, not knowing what to do. Amir Mu'min al-Islam says to her, come with me. He takes her back to the date seller. He says to her, the fellow, that this girl has, will get into trouble. She has bought these dates. This, uh, it was not the right thing. Her master not agreeing. Can you give her her money back? He says, instead of saying yes, now this man did not recognize who Ali was. So he, he, Imam Ali came close to him, so he took a fist and he punched the Imam on the chest to say, get away from me, move away. He actually hit him. When he hit him, two or three people told him, have you gone mad? This man is the one who is the victor of Badr, Ohad, Khaybar, Khandak, Hunayn, and you have punched him. On top of that, he is Amir at the moment. So this man now began to shake. And he apologized. I am so sorry. Amir Muhammad al -Islam said, forget the punch. Give the money back to this woman. Because when someone comes and changes their mind about a purchase they have made, Rasulullah would say, give them their money back. So he gave the money, of course. As for the punch, Imam Ali pretended as if it had never happened. This is the sign. Anybody else would have said, on top of that, what about the punch? He would have made him sweat a bit. This is humbleness, humility. When we do not think that we are anything, and we are told this, a man had come to Imam Radha alayhi salam and asking for advice. Ya Mawla, give me some advice on how to run my life. Imam gave him 10 advice, which is the in hadith. But then when he reached the 10th, he said, and the 10th, Wallah, that 10th one, how will you be able to do it? How can anyone do it? The tenth one. So he said, what? What is the tenth one? Imam said to him that you do not consider anyone above you. Always you consider yourself in your heart less than anybody next to you. 
He says, even the kuffar, even the criminals. Imam Ali Salam said to him, everyone say that there may be a goodness in this person that will allow them to repent and reach Allah's favor and enter Jannah. And there may be some evil in me that has not manifested itself that would ultimately be my downfall and I will lose Jannah. Be humble, right? And what we do is exactly the opposite. And when we get this humility, then everything becomes very beautiful in connection to Allah. Our soul becomes expansive. People think by, by having a little bit of arrogance, we become big. No, we become small. By having humbleness, we become big. Rasulullah said to the Muslimin once, مَا لِي لَا أَرَاكْ فِيكُمْ حَلَاوَةَ الْعِبَادَةِ How come I don't see you enjoying your ibadah, your salat? So they said, so مَا هِي حَلَاوَةَ الْعِبَادَةِ What is this halawa? How do we get it sweet? He said, التواضع Become humble and see how sweet ibadah becomes. It is when we stand in front of God in our, you know, poor comprehension saying, Ya Allah, yes, of course, you are Lord, but I am something as well. I, you know, I have these accomplishments, I have these strengths, I have this, I have that. And that is why we do not feel that sweetness in the ibadah. This arrogance, brothers and sisters, is actually the only thing, the only thing that lands people in hell. If you can eliminate it, Look at this ayah in Quran, Surah Zumar, ayat is 60, and then we finish our time. It says, my time is over. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanij rajeem. Alaysa fi jahannam mathwan lil mutakabbirin. Has jahannam been created to process anyone except mutakabbirin? That is why it exists, to process the arrogant. If there is no arrogance, there is no need to have jahannam. So these are ways in which if we inculcate then our relationship with people, although which feels strange in the beginning, will give us that lightness of heart. We will be free to do what we have come to do in dunya, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, I want to talk about the masaib of a great man. A man, as long as he was alive, Hussein ibn Ali, his heart was full. A man, as long as he stood there, Zainab sallamullahi alayha would look at him and her heart would be tranquil. This is Abbas alayhi salam. We know the story of how Ummul Banin came to the house of Amirul Mu'mineen and how he sought out a lady from a tribe who were known for their valor and their bravery so that he would have sons from her who would be shields for Hussein alayhi salam in Ashura. There comes a time, there were four brothers, Abbas alayhi salam, my master Abbas was born 26 Hijra, that his brother was born Uthman, Abdullah, 10 years later than Uthman, and the last one Jafar, who was in a cradle when Imam died, Imam Ali. These young men are there. There comes a time on that morning when Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam go, Abbas alayhi salam gathers his three brothers, Right? And he says to them, go, go in the protection of our brother Hussein. And they go and they're martyred. But there comes a time now when there is no one left. Abbas salam, comes to stand in front of Imam al Hussein. He says to him, Oh brother, I am tired of this life. Allow me to go. Too long I have stood here while they have done what they wanted. Let me go. And Imam alayhi salam says to him, Abbas, you are the commander of my army. How can I let you go? And Abbas alayhi salam looks down and says, Mawla, where is that army? The army is finished. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says that it was my desire, Ya Abbas, that we enter this battlefield together, me and you, and we show them whose sons we are. We remind them of Haydar. But do one thing for me, Abbas, before we do that. You see how the children are pleading for water. There is so much thirst. Go to the Furat, bring some water for them so that their thirst can be slain. Abbas kisses Imam Hussein on the forehead. 
and he takes that water skin from Sakina and Sakina is excited. She tells the children, soon we will have water. My uncle Abbas will bring us water. He comes to say his final farewell to his sister Zainab. They say that Zainab Salamullahi Alaiha, when she saw this man at the prime of his health, 34 years of age, Abbas, everybody knows him, everybody respects him. She says to him that when I was younger, I used to hear from our father that I would go to Kufa with my hands bound and with my hijab removed. And I used to think that that sister who has a brother like Abbas, who would dare to touch her? But today, Abbas, you stand in front of me and I know these things will happen now because whoever has gone into that battlefield has not come back. Abbas salam, says his farewells. He goes into the river. He goes into the river and he reaches it. He fights his way through it and he fills that mush. He fills that water skin. But when he comes back, this is the meanness of the enemy. They shout out, beware, beware, not a single drop should get back to the camp of Hussein. We do not want them to have any water. And the enemy hiding behind the trees, one of them, Nawfal bin Azraq, he severs the arm of Abbas, alayhi salam. Another Mal'oon, he severs the left arm, Hakim bin, Hakim bin Tufail. And in this way now, Abbas, alayhi salam, transfers this water skin to his teeth. He transfers the water skin to his teeth when suddenly now the enemy is bold. Now they start to shoot the arrows at him. In this rain of arrows, there are two arrows. One of them, it hits the water skin and the water begins to come down and one of them punches into the eye of Abbas. It seems now Abbas no longer wants to go back. He turns the horse. The horse is now turned back to the Furat. Imam alayhi salam sees from a distance the standard, the alam that Abbas had kept with him, it begins to fall. And he realizes the awful truth of what is happening and he says, these are the words of Hussein al-an in kasara dhahri today, now my back is broken. I no longer have the strength. He comes, when he comes to Abbas alayhi salam, Abbas has an arrow in his eye. You know, brothers and sisters, when something comes towards our eye, what do we do? We take our hand and we protect our eyes. If something lodges in our eye, we take our hand and we remove or try to remove. I can only imagine the agony of Abbas. There is an arrow in his eye, but he does not have the hands to do anything about it. He says to Hussein, oh, my master, Hussein, leave me here. I don't know why he said this. The maqtal is not clear as to why he says this. My own idea is that up to now, he used to help al Hussein bring the bodies back. But he is thinking to himself, will my brother now be able to carry my body? Maybe he's thinking he does not want to have Sakina look at his body. Imam Ali Salam respects this wish. Abbas goes to heaven and then Imam brings that standard back. And in one of the maktals, I read that when Imam is slowly coming back with this flag down, Sakina sees it. She sees her father and she realizes immediately what it means. And she says, Baba, I am not thirsty anymore. You, you bring my uncle. I don't want any water anymore. Please recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Please stay while we hear from the maktal as well of Abu Abdullah al-Husayn. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. ثانيا على حب الزهراء صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله 
صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلوم لعن الله الظالمين لكم من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أصحابه الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين السلام عليك يا أبا الفضل العباس يا باب الحوائج عظم الله لك الأجر يا أم البنين Um Banin is here tonight, brothers and sisters. She is here tonight. Her soul is flying among the women in the majlis tonight. Sahib al Asri was Zaman is also with us tonight. The one that is heartbroken. He sends his salam to Abbas. Salam, my uncle Abbas, who sacrificed himself. The one who protected his brother The one who had his hand severed The one that tried hard to get water for Hussein Imam Sahib Al-Zaman, the awaiting Imam is the one we should be paying our condolences tonight, brother and sisters <laughs> Imam Al-Mahdi is known for serving water to the visitors of the Haram of Hussein and Abbas. Listen, what, listen to what Abbas says about his visitors. Ya Hussein, oh my brother Hussein, my visitors come from all over the world. I want to greet them, I want to welcome them. How can I hug them all when I have no hands? How can I hold them close to my chest? Oh, my brother Hussein, I beg you, bring my hands back to me and gently remove the arrow from my eye because I want to see my visitors because I can't see with the arrow in my eye I want to see my visitors and see as they cry for me I want to grant them their wishes if you can please come to me ya Hussain and Zainab is not to come with you by the broken ribs of your mother Fatima why Abu Fadl because she might see me and ask about the promise I made on Ashura I am embarrassed in front of her and Sukaina. Hussein answers Abbas. He says, If I could crawl, I would do that and come to you. But forgive me, ya Abbas. The arrow in your eye nearly stopped my heart and almost stopped me breathing. Ya Abbas, if your head got injured, I have a body without a head, and my body was torn apart by the trampling of the horses, 
and my infant child was killed while thirsty. If you are embarrassed in front of Zainab, Zainab is also embarrassed because she was forced to become a captive and forced into the court of Yazid. And in front of her eyes was my head while the tyrant Yazid was breaking my teeth. Ruqayya, Ruqayya. She died while hugging my head through the devastation. She became an orphan because of her great loss. Brothers and sisters, let us see if, let us see if Umm al-Banin is among us tonight. Umm al-Banin, the mother who loved her son Abbas, but who loved her religion more. Abbas is talking to his mother, Umm al-Banin. He cries, oh mother, my flag fell in the river Furat and I collapsed covered in blood. Ya Umm al Banin, Hussein broke my heart with his suffering next to me. I feel devastated for Hussein while he is running towards me and seeing me being martyred. He poured his tears all over me. Oh, mother, I am living in. I wish you were near my body while Hussein is mixing his tears with my blood. Oh, mother, I did not cry because of how badly I was treated, but I was crying for Hussein, the king of all martyrs, Hussein. Oh, mother, Umm al I am sure that Zahra is weeping for my death, and she is wailing for my cry and the cry of her son Hussein. Oh mother, I cry for Zainab, who is awaiting my return. She remained with no protector. Tonight is the night of Abbas. Everyone wonders what happened to me to Zainab after Abbas. She cried, oh my brother Abbas. Oh, you kind-hearted one. Oh, you who I counted on. Oh, you whom I feel so disappointed as you are not coming back. Ya Abbas, the tents went on fire. And so did my clothes. I am feeling lonely and responsible. I feel extreme hardship. Ya Abbas, this abaya I am wearing belongs to my mother Fatima, who wiped my tears with it. And it has a hole in it where the nail pierced my mother's chest. Uh, Abbas replied to Zainab, he said, Oh, my sister Zainab, please send my salams to Zahra and tell her that I could not keep my promise to my Imam to protect Zainab and to stop her from entering the court of Yazid. Ya Zainab, when you get back to Medina, congratulate Umm al -Banin and say Abbas has been sacrificed for Hussain. Antam Allah, ajurakum on the day of Ashura. There was no one remaining with Hussein to support him. All his children have been killed. All his companion has been killed. And no one remained except the moon of Bani Hashim. Abbas cried to his brother. 
يا حسين I want to join your father I want to join your grandfather and your mother Fatima Please allow me to go to the battlefield Hussein replied Ya Abbas You are my flag bearer You are the backbone of my army So Abbas went back down He sat down with his head Hanging down between his knees Zainab had gathered all the children and the women The women kept coming to Zainab Wailing my child is dying from thirst Others come crying, my child needs milk. Zainab goes and calls on Abbas. He calls him Abu Fadil. Come here, please, my brother, come. She asked him to look at the women and the children, to look at how desperate they are for water. Abbas replies, what should I do, ya Zainab? Hussein is not agreeing for me to go yet. He hasn't given me permission to enter the battlefield. Abbas went to Hussein again, begging and requesting to go to the battlefield. Hussein knows that if he goes, he won't come back. He said, I won't allow you to go and fight, but I would like you to go and bring some water from the river. Hussein and Abbas are about to say goodbye. This was one of the biggest and most heartbreaking scenes, brothers and sisters. He hugged him closely to his, to his chest, who is standing near them. Zainab is watching them say goodbye to each other. Zainab was witnessing how attached these two are to each other, hugging for a long time, intertwined in their love. So Kaina came, she came out calling to her uncle. Oh, Uncle Abbas, please don't go. Abbas put his hand on her chest and said, I'm just going to get water, Sukaina. So he left the tents and went to bring back the water. Thousands of men came towards him, waving their flags, row after row of soldiers of the enemy, trying to attack the moon of Bani Hashim. The enemy became anxious, noticing a flag bearer looking like Amir al Mu'mineen with the bravery of Amir al Mu'mineen. He rode them, he rode through them and tore the enemy apart. He rode through them until he reached the bank of the river Fura. So he approached the river and he grabbed some water. He never forgot the thirst of his master Hussein. He cried, كيف أشرب الماء ومولاي حسين عطشان How can I drink when my master Hussein is thirsty? While he was doing this, Umm al banin came in front of him in a vision and sang it his father Ali. He rem remembered the will that the Prophet had made for him. What was that will, O Rasulullah? When you get there, when you get to the river, remember your brother Hussein who is thirsty. Umm al banin said, I sacrificed myself by keeping nights up and brought you up in the right way. Abbas, when you get to the river, don't drink the water. Abbas replied, this is the water that is flowing and is cold, but I will never taste it before my brother Hussein, knowing his six month old baby is dying from thirst. So he filled the water bag and put it on his shoulder. He wanted to get the water to Hussein, the cursed one, Umar ibn Sa'ad. He said, surround him in all directions. Because if the water reaches Hussein, he will kill every one of you. The army attacked Abbas from every direction. Some with their swords, others with their spears, and others with stones. 
Hussein went towards the river to support his brother Abbas. So the brothers killed a huge number from the enemy. Another one, another cursed one cried out, you must separate them. How should we do that? The cursed one says, go, go attack the tents. Go attack the women and the children. So all the, all the horses started galloping towards the tents, attacking the woman. Zainab came out screaming, Hussein, come and help me, Hussein. Hussein, hearing this, said his goodbyes to Abel Father. He went to head back to the tents. Hussein said, I will watch your flag from the tents, Ya Abbas. Make sure you keep your flag flying. This will assure, this will assure me that you are okay. The army continued to attack him from all directions. And Abbas killed lots of them. There was a cursed one hiding behind a tree. He came out from behind the tree. He lifted his sword very high. And he struck the right hand of Abel Fadl al Abbas. And he cut off the right of Abbas. Abbas cried, Wallahi in Gata'atamu Yameeni. Inni Uhami Abadan Andi'ini. وعن إمام صادق اليقين. If you cut off my right hand, I will forever protect my religion and continue to support my true Imam. He continued to hold the flag against his chest. His brother Hussein still seeing his flag flying. He held his sword in his left hand. Another cursed one came from behind the tree and severed the left hand of Abbas. <laughs> Abbas continued to hold the flag and was heading toward the tents to get the water to the women and children. They blocked his access and the arrows started flying. Arrows hit several parts of his body. The one that really hurt him the most was the arrow that hit the water bag. The water bag that was meant to be for Hussein, for the women and for Sukaina. The water starts pouring from the bag. Abbas started crying loudly. What is he saying now, brothers and sisters? He said, I carry this water, and my aim was to get it to Hussein. But what can I do? They have cut off my hands. But that wasn't enough, brothers and sisters. There's more. Harmala. He prepared an arrow and shot it into the right eye of Abel Fadl al Abbas. <laughs> So Abbas, <laughs> he fell down on the neck of the horse. He was attempting to remove the arrow from his eye. The turban fell off his head. His head was now exposed. Hakim ibn Tufail came and struck the head of Abbas with an iron paw. <laughs> Imagine the scene, brothers and sisters. Abbas wanted to so desperately to return the water to the tents, while Abbas is bent over his horse. The cursed one lifted the pole very high and struck him on his head. His head has been split in half, and the blood is pouring on the ground. Abbas fell off his horse. Normally when someone falls off a horse, they break their fall using their hands. But Abbas Fadl Abbas didn't have any hands. So Abbas fell onto his face, and this pushed the arrow further into his eye. 
and the army charged on him, ripping his body to pieces. Then for the first time ever, Abbas calls out Akhi Hussain. Oh my brother Hussain. This is the first time that Abbas has called Hussain his brother. He had always addressed Hussain as his master or Abba Abdullah. Hussain didn't hear him. So he kept raising his voice louder and louder. Oh my brother Hussain. Hussein came running, leaving the women and children behind. While he was going towards Abbas, he noticed the right hand of Abbas on the sand. He stopped and kissed it and continued towards Abbas. He came across the left hand of Abbas. The women of the tent cannot see him. Abbas cries, I cannot see. I can't see where I am going. Oh, light of my eyes, Hussein. The whole world has become dark for me. Uh, when Hussein got there, he leapt off his horse. He and he sat down next to his brother Abbas. But because he can't see, Abbas asked who it is. I am your brother Hussein. Abbas asks Hussein to help him. He asks him to remove the arrow from his eye because he has no, he has no hands to remove it himself. Abbas wants to see his brother one more time. Abbas wants to hug his brother one more time. But how can he without any hands, brothers and sisters? Hussein replied, Ya Abbas, how can I remove the hand piece? How can I remove the arrow piece in your eye? It is embedded so deep in your eye. Oh, brother Abbas, you always address me as master. And where yet when you fell today, you addressed me as brother. Hussein put his brother's head onto his lap. He put Abbas's head onto his lap. But Abbas kept moving his head. Abbas asked Hussein that his head be placed on the ground. Hussein asked him, why? Why do you keep removing your head from my lap? Abbas replied, when the prophet passed away, his head was on Ali's lap. When Ali died, his head was on Hussein's lap. His head was on Hassan's lap. And when Hassan died, his head was on your lap, Ya Hussein. So who will hold your head in their lap when you die? Ya Abu Abdullah. Oh brother, who will shut your eyes and will support you after me? So he placed his head on the ground and now he is moving it left and right. It has been narrated, brothers and sisters, that the Prophet gave water to all the masters of Karbala. Ah, and when he came to do the same to Abbas, Abbas kept turning his head from right to left, refusing to drink. Abbas, the image of Abbas, most loyalty, oh grandfather, Ya Rasulallah, I don't want to drink the water, by Allah, I don't want it, while Hussein's neck is going to be severed, Sukaina is awaiting my return, so are the rest of the children, Amir al muminin asked him to drink, but he said, oh father, I carried the water to bring back to Hussein, Hussain, but they have cut off my hands and I am worried that I, that I will upset Zahra if I drink water. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-ali al-azim Brothers and sisters, Brothers tonight, and sisters is tonight is the night of Abel Fadl al-Abbas. Please remember your sick ones, sick ones, the ones that have passed. Abel Fadl al-Abbas, ask him and he will, he will grant all your special needs. Please join me in reciting five times dua and may you jib. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه فسوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن ويكشف السوء أمن يا عباس call out Abbas alayhi salam Ya Abbas call out Bab al-Hawaij Ya Abbas call out Qamar Bani Hashim the moon of Banu Hashim Ya Abbas he's the gate of Hawaij the grantor of desires Fi Sabilillah insha'Allah everyone call out Ya Abbas Ya Abbas Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas. What happened in the camp? Let us remember. What happened in the camp? Let us remember. Everyone's thirsty, calling for water. Everyone's thirsty, calling for water. Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas. Let us remember and understand what happened in Ashura in that land. In Karbala was the progeny, thirsty, hungry, facing tyranny, and the cries of the children everywhere. And the cries of the children everywhere. Everyone's thirsty and in despair. Everyone's thirsty and in despair. What happened in the camp? Let us remember what happened. Let us remember everyone's thirsty, calling for water. Everyone calling. Ya Abbas. Abbas was thirsty, was getting weaker. But with immense hardship, he got to the river. He reached to drink, but remembered Hussein. Oh, my soul, he called, don't be so vain. What am I to answer tomorrow to Haidar? What am I to answer tomorrow to Haidar? Everyone's thirsty as I touch the water. Everyone's thirsty as I touch the water. What happened in the camp? Let us remember what happened. Everyone's thirsty, everyone's calling for water, everyone's thirsty. Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas.
Hey, remain thirsty, fill the water sack, headed back to the tents, back to the camp. That's when the enemies heightened the attack until they were able to cut his right hand. He took the water in his left and said, He took the water in his left and said, Everyone's thirsty to the camp I'll head. Everyone's thirsty to the camp I'll head. What happened? What happened? Let us remember what happened in the camp. Everyone's thirsty, everyone calling for water, calling. Everyone's thirsty, calling for water, Ya Abbas. MashaAllah. Abbas left and right hand was now caught Persevered and took the bag with his mouth Until they struck the bag with an arrow That's when he felt pain, he felt the sorrow But added to the pain was narrow in his eye But added to the pain, an arrow in his eye, Sakina is thirsty, he started to cry. Everyone's thirsty, he started to cry. What happened? What happened? Let us remember what happened. Let us, everyone's thirsty, everyone calling for water. And calling for water, Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas. Abbas fell face first, hit with a pillar. Ya Hussein, he cried, Come to me, my brother. Hussein rushed to him, but Abbas left him too. Brother, my back's broken. Now what's there to do? There's no escaping from this heartless enemy. There's no escaping from this heartless enemy. Everyone's thirsty, but soon we'll meet Ali. Everyone's thirsty, but soon we'll meet Ali. Ali, what happened in the camp? What happened in the camp? Everyone's thirsty. Everyone's thirsty. Mashallah, ya Abbas. Ya Abbas. Hey, Abbas. Call Abbas, alayhi salam. Ya Abbas. Ya. Zikr Mustafa, ya Hussein. Zikr Mustafa, ya Hussein. Zikr Murtaza, ya Hussein. Zikr Murtaza. Zikr Mustafa. Zikr Mustafa, loud. Zikr Murtaza. Zikr Murtaza. Zikr Fatima. Zikr Fatima. Zikr Mujtaba. Zikr Mujtaba. Zikr Fatima. Zikr Fatima. Zikr Mujtaba. Zikr Mujtaba. Zikr Aba Abdullah. Zikr Aba Abdullah. Zikr Aba Abdullah. 
ابو فاضل ابو فاضل يا ابو فاضل ابو فاضل ابو فاضل يا ابو ابو فاضل ابو فاضل ابو فاضل ابو فاضل يا ابو فاضل ابو فاضل ابو فاضل يا ابو فاضل ابو فاضل ابو فاضل raise your voices voices abu fadil abu fadil it's just you in karbala now abu fadil abu fadil abu fadil abu fadil Abu Fadl, Abu Fadl. Allahumma kull waliyka. Hujjatay bin al Hasan. Everyone, raise your voices. في هذه الساعة السلام عليكم يا أولياء الله السلام عليكم يا أنبياء الله السلام عليكم يا شهداء الله جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوا على محمد وآل محمد